Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and I was going to say Jerry's here, but she totally flaked on us, and this is Stuff You Should Know. (laughs) Yeah, I've, I've never wanted to be able to make a dolphin sound more in my life. That's, I mean, <laughs> that was med- medium. Better than I could do. Well, let's hear yours. I, I put but I've heard better. out there. No, I mean, I can't. I don't even want to try. Okay, how about this? Uh, pet my nose. I'm a dolphin. Well, that was good. <laughs> okay. A dolphin that speaks English is pretty impressive, Chuck. I like that interpretation. Yeah. USA. <laughs> so, USA and Canada. <laughs> Um, so we're talking today, the reason we're, we're trying to speak dolphin, Chuck, is because we're talking about animal communication. And just to clear things up right out of the gate, we're not talking about animal communication where we try to teach animals to speak human languages, right. whether it be sign language, English, whatever. Yeah. We already did that in our live Coco the Gorilla episode. Yeah. No, we're going the other way here because there's a whole other tranche as the French would say, Mm -hmm. of research that is going into listening to, decoding, understanding, and potentially speaking animal animal languages. (laughs) Yeah. And this is one, it's like one of the rare cases uh, where, as we'll see, um, for a lot of years, science was like... um, Animals don't do this. Like they, they they grunt at each other. They make little instinctual noises, but they're not really communicating right. with each other or us. Don't kid yourself. And this is a rare case where I'm like, I don't care what science says. My pets speak to me, mm-hmm. and I understand what they're saying. Yeah, no, this um, researching this, I was haunted by the ghost of Tracy Wilson. Do you remember like <laughs> – how hardcore she was about not anthropomorphizing years back. Yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, I, sorry, Tracy. I do it. And Tracy's a cat person. I know. For but shame. she refuses to speak to her cat. No, I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fair point. And I think we've made that point many times whenever we've talked about pets, like communicating. Or I think any time we talk about pets, we kind of both agree that, no, there's – they're obviously communicating in ways we're just not fully aware of, and it's actually pretty anthropocentric Ooh. to just assume that because we don't understand it, they're not doing it. And luckily, like I said, there's a whole tranche of um, research that is assuming, no, these these animals have communication patterns that yeah. kind of follow the same general idea of human language. Yeah. And um, as such, we have a chance of, of being able to understand it. But the whole the whole thing is based on this idea, like you said, science has long thought like that there was not, that any any sounds they make were instinctual, that there wasn't any purpose behind them. It was just the, the it was an involuntary response to something that evolution had kind of bred into that animal, and that was also predicated on this idea that Rene Descartes put out there, which is. Animals have, like, no inner lives whatsoever that only humans do. Boo. Yeah, I'm very disappointed with Descartes. And I know we've talked about this before probably multiple times, but um, it, it, it bears repeating because he set that tone for centuries to follow. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Uh, but, I mean, you needn't only look at your dog <clears throat> and, to a certain degree, your cat— Mm-hmm. But, you know, the first couple of animals we're going to talk about that uh, Livia helped us with this, that she was keen to point out uh, humans have been around for a while and, you know, communicate with if you are the the owner slash, uh, you know, mother, father, uh, caretaker of these animals. We're talking about dogs and horses. Mm-hmm. And if you have ever had a dog, you know what um, at least this one thing is, and that's called puppy dog eyes. And this is a, a, a trait. It's actually a muscle called the, the loam, the L-O-A-M, the levator anguli oculi medialis. Presto. <laughs> uh, it's a muscle in the, in the <clears throat> eyebrow, basically, of a dog that evolved from a wolf. Like, they've, they've done studies and found that wolves don't still have this. 
uh, oh, wow. or, or wolves don't have this. Right. And the only dog out of like the eight breeds they studied that didn't evolve this way was the Siberian Husky, uh, which is, I guess, closely related to a wolf. It's a wolf posing as a dog. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever known Huskies. I'm not knocking any breed. I like Huskies just fine. Sure. I've known a few, but and I've, I've never been able to have a good connection with them. Yeah. And that may be part of the reason is that they haven't evolved as far away as, as, you know, we have with our other domesticated friends. Oh, that's a great point. Uh, but they have done studies. There was one published in the uh, proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences who um, studied uh, dogs out for adoption at like a, you know, a, what do you call it? Well, I can't even think of the word. An adoption drive. <laughs> sure. It wasn't a drive, but just in the in the pound. Okay. What do you call those, though? An animal shelter? <laughs> animal shelter. You know how the easiest word won't come to you sometimes? Yeah, I do. I've yeah. been there, buddy. It's Believe very frustrating. Me. Anyway, uh, shelter dogs, and they <clears> found, <throat> they studied all these dogs, um, like hundreds and hundreds of them over long periods of time, mm -hmm. and they found that the dogs to use these loam muscles to make their eyes bigger and raise that inner brow were adopted quicker. Yeah. I think it has to do with um, exaggerating the shape of the eyes, which, as we've talked about, the kinder schema, I believe, in the science of cute. Yeah. That would just make them automatically cuter. Yeah. big Bigger eyes. I mean, that's why all those Disney characters have big eyes. But the, Exactly. But the, the, the point of this is that dogs – we have clear evidence that dogs evolved a way to be expressive through their facial expressions yeah. in ways that he, it affect humans. And that's a form of communication. Exactly. That's just one form of communication. Mm -hmm. So it isn't anthropomorphizing to say that, uh, you know, dogs have emotions and that they express these emotions, like things like being happy to see mm -hmm. their their uh, friend, their human friend. Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy named ecologist Carl Safina. And um, he he points out that his whole thing is like dogs love us. Clearly, it's clear as day. Anybody who owns a dog knows this. And anybody who says otherwise is just being a real stick in the mud, basically. Mm -hmm. But um, he pointed out that really the the whole thing broke open finally. Descartes' smelly corpse was finally cast <laughs> off of the anim animal behavior uh, field uh -huh. in the – 60s, I believe, um, when uh, observational studies of animals really started in earnest, thanks to people like Jane Goodall and yeah. um, I can't remember who her, oh, Louis Leakey, yeah. um, that those people were, were coming back with reports like, mm, guys, these, are, these animals clearly interact with one another in ways that humans would consider empathy. Mm -hmm. um, they're communicating. They're doing all sorts of stuff we supposedly think they can't. And then today, it's being demonstrated. All of these these observations are being proven because we've fashioned MRI machines that dogs can go in, and we don't like sedate the dog and like put them in there. It's not going to have any effect. They they've made these open machines, and then they kind of introduce them to the dogs, and the the, the dog's free to come or go in the MRI. And if the dog says they're long enough, yeah. they can study the the dog's brain activity. And what they're seeing is. Nope, these, these dogs are smart. They definitely have an inner life, and most of what we're taking as um, emotional communication is probably totally correct. Yeah, and if they sit there long enough, they're good boys and good girls. <laughs> That's right. And they get treats. That's right. Uh, we also have horses. If you want to look at another animal that humans have probably had the longest relationship with, and there is a horse trainer slash neuroscientist which is a very handy thing if you're going to talk about animal communication. Mm -hmm. uh, her name is Janet Jones, not the uh, former gymnast uh, who was married to Wayne Gretzky. You remember oh, her? Oh, I knew that name sounded familiar, but I didn't know why. Did I say former gymnast, former actress? She was a gymnast too, though, right? I haven't paid that much attention to Wayne Gretzky's <laughs> marital life. <laughs> Uh, anyway, different Janet Jones, and she said that uh, horses and humans uh, are are different because humans evolved into predators. Horses mm -hmm. evolved from prey species. Mm -hmm. So, like, we have different ways of looking at the world when you're riding a horse around outside, and we communicate that to one another. Um, you know, also throw in the fact that horses have a 340-degree range of vision with those awesome, humongous 
eyes on the sides of their heads. Yeah, that last 20 degrees really ticks horses off. <laughs> it really does. Uh, but if you're like, if you're riding along and a horse, a horse might be scared about, and Livia uses a great illustration of like an umbrella opening, it might spook a horse. But the human's like, hey, that's just an umbrella. So they're going to, you know, sitting atop the horse, they're going to relax the horse by, you know, I'm not a horse rider, so I don't really know how you do this, but by moving your body and flexing your muscles in a certain way with the rhythm of the horse to let them know that it's cool. Right. Um, so what Janet Jones is basically saying is, is she wrote this really cool article called Becoming a Centaur in Aeon, is that <clears throat> through this communication that horses and humans have, have co-evolved together to um, to understand with one another and to be able to train one another with, you're becoming like kind of a super organism for that time where you are atop a horse yeah. and the horse is below you and you guys are working in conjunction together, sharing sensory information. I love that. I yeah, want to ride more horses in my life. There's a That's a great, great thing to try to do, Chuck. <laughs> I've only done it a couple of times and I loved it. I haven't for a really long time. I used to as a kid a lot more. I have like a, on the prairie. Yeah, <laughs> when you were <laughs> when you were westward bound. Yeah, in yeah. the wagon train. <laughs> uh, birds. We're going to talk a lot about birds because obviously bird vocalizations are. Um, you can just listen to birds and and tell that they are specific, and that that probably means something. Um, but humans and birds interact in different ways around the world, uh, specifically uh, a couple of tribes. The Jawa people in Mozambique and the uh, Hadza of Tanzania both use what are called honey guides. Mm -hmm. And they are birds that they can call. They each, you know, use different calls in their in their respective places to call over these birds. And the birds come a-flying in and say, hey, follow me and we'll show you the honey. And they go and get the honey. And if you're asking, like, well, why in the world would they do this? It's because the birds get the wax after they're finished. So it's a, a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah, and um, they've actually tested to make sure it's not just the presence of humans making sounds that catch the birds' attention and mm -hmm. then the birds associate humans with, with getting honey. Um, they tested other, like, control sounds, um, but there are specific calls that uh, Jawa people use. It's like a bird, something like that. Mm -hmm. And that is what the honey guides respond to. They don't respond to, hey, honey guide, or anything like that. They respond to this call that the Jawa people have been using for countless generations mm -hmm. and that the Jawa have been passing down from generation to generation. That also means that the honey guides, wild birds, not tamed in any way. They're not coerced to do this. They're wild animals who, who clearly communicate with humans. They're passing down that that burr hum sound that a Jawa person makes in the woods means go find that person and take them to some honey and they'll la they'll leave the honeycombs for you. Like people and birds passing down this common information that forms a symbiotic relationship. That's nuts. Yeah. And I imagine if they said, hey, honey guides, come over here, mm -hmm. the birds would say, why y'all speak in English? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's really weird. Yeah. Uh, what happened to Burr Hum? <laughs> there are also, of course, and we're not going to get you know too much into this, but you know, for for hunters, all kinds of mating calls, and and I guess you don't have to hunt to use a mating call. If you want to, if you want to call a moose over just to say hello, you could use a moose mating call. But all kinds of, um, and it's not just mating calls, but usually it's some kind of mating call for any kind of game that you're hunting or ducks or stuff like that. Yeah, I crossed that part out. <laughs> Well, it's people communicating with animals at the very least. So you mentioned birds <clears throat> and how we're going to talk about birds a lot, but um, birds are just an obvious place to start. And that's where humans kind of started in tracking animal communication, whether they realized it was animal communication or not. Birdsong has always kind of captured the human imagination. And apparently back in the day, they started to try to uh, assign musical notation to <laughs> to recording bird song by hand on paper. Good luck, right? And then as as um, you know, the technology progressed and we got better at at recording and reproducing sound. Um, one of the things that we really started compiling a lot of were bird song, bird songs. Sure. Is bird song plural and singular? It I, seems like the kind of word that yeah, it could be. I think so. Bird song guy. 
Um, <laughs> and there's actually a really great collection at, at Cornell. Their ornithology um, lab has what's called the Macaulay Library. And um, I've got this app called Merlin. It's a bird identification app. It's free. I think you just have to sign up with your email. And if you hear a bird call, you just open Merlin, and it's like Shazam for birds. Yeah, it's amazing. And it is amazing. And, like, it, 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 it just sits there and listens, and then it goes, oh, is it this bird? And it shows you a picture and tells you what that bird is, and you say, that's exactly what bird that is. Thanks, Merlin. Merlin gives you a wink and goes back to sleep in your phone. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very popular app and very popular in my family. We use it all the time. Um, nice. I'll, I'll, a lot of we have a lot of identification apps that are really handy. Uh, we have like bird apps and um, plant, of course, and flower apps. Emily has mm-hmm. those, and then I have an art app uh, where you can point it at a a painting or something, and it'll it'll tell you if it's in the database. Of course, it'll tell you who it's like it is. Cubist. <laughs> no, it'll like tell you the actual artist. I got you. You know, Max Cubist. (laughs) So let me just set this up real quick, Chuck, and I say we take a break. Okay. But although people were like, okay, animals have somewhat richer inner lives than we had always suspected, but they're still not using anything like what we would consider language. Mm -hmm. Um, That carried on until the 70s, until a couple of studies came through, kicked the legs out from under that. Mm, What a great cliffy. So, I said Cliffy. Pe- <laughs> people know that means cliffhanger, I hope. Long-time listeners, too. Long-time listeners. Uh, so, yeah, you were talking about until the 70s, and that's when I mentioned that science had always kind of poo-pooed it, and it was in the 70s where people finally started, you know, there were some sort of rogue hippie scientists here and there <laughs> that were like nobody was listening to, basically. Sure. But in the 70s is when a couple of big studies came out that you mentioned pre-break. Uh, one was in 1977. Uh, a couple of primate scientists named Robert C. Farth, say Farth, and Dorothy Cheney, uh, and they were working with one of those hippies, Peter Marler, uh, who was an animal communication expert when that wasn't cool. And they were studying vervet monkeys in Kenya, and this is a pretty big breakthrough and pretty remarkable. Uh, they found that they they are using different, um, we're going to say things like words, for lack of a better term, um, sounds, vocalizations. Mm-hmm. But they use different words for different threats. Uh, so, like, they notice that, uh, like, something flying, like an eagle, versus something on the ground, like a snake, like a python, mm-hmm. they would use those to indicate one or the other. And they, they learned this by making recordings of it. And when they played it, sure enough, the monkey would look up into the sky or search the ground around them for the snake. Yeah, depending on what call they played back. That's right. Not 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 depending on what... Brian Adams song they played. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, Smarty. So um, the, you can still make a case that, that okay, so, so what? They have these specific words for snake or for eagle, but it doesn't mean that it's anything more than instinct for a monkey to utter this particular cry when it sees a snake and other monkeys to respond in kind. And it's all innate. And none of it means that they're using grammar or language. Everybody said, okay, fine, fine. Let's just keep waiting a few more years. And we're going to go forward to uh, Klaus Zuberbuehler. Great name. Who is Swiss, as um, as people who name their family Zuberbuehler are want to be. Uh-huh. He studied the um, Campbell's monkeys in uh, the Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I believe the tomato Campbell's monkeys. And he found nothing. Not, not Campbell's tomato soup? Yeah. <laughs> and he found that they actually use suffixes, right? So mm-hmm. if they use the, the alarm call croc or crack, K-R-A-K, that's how they spelled it, not the, the Campbell's monkeys, but sure. uh, Zuber Bueller and his <laughs> yeah. friends. Yeah. That means leopard is coming. But cracku means it's a, just a general alarm, like look out or heads up or something like this. Mm-hmm. Um, they can also like supplement the crack or cracku with um, booms that they they uh, will make. It can mean like come this way. 
Um, it can mean that there's a falling tree branch, depending on if they amend it with the suffix oo. So Zuber Bueller is saying like, guys, this is grammar. Those yeah. are words. This cannot possibly just be instinctual. And even if it is instinctual, then that would suggest that animals, at least some types of monkeys, have a language instinct too. Who? That's a whole other ball of wax like we talked about before. But Zuber Bueller's like, dude, come on. And people started to finally be like, all right, fine. We're, we'll we'll kind of get on board with this idea that the animals are using something like language possibly. Yeah. And he even, when, you know, as an example of how it's something that humans could potentially understand once they learn it, he was warned off by a leopard by hearing the leopard call, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was in a radio lab at one point. Shout out to radio lab. Yeah. Some of the OGs like us. But yeah, Zuber Bueller was like, hey, you know, I heard them sound the leopard alarm and that meant that I needed to, to you know, be watchful. Yeah, they were. I didn't I didn't understand. I didn't go listen to that episode of Radio Lab, so I'm not sure if they were warning him or he was just paying attention that they were. I think it's were, that. OK, so I, I think. But who knows? Maybe they way, like Zuber Bueller. He spoke. He spoke Campbell's monkey for that moment and it helped them out. Yeah, sure. So, um, and it wasn't just uh, Zuber Bueller who did. Uh, apparently, other animals, including birds and other monkeys that live around Campbell's monkeys, have learned what crock mm -hmm. or crack means too and will respond in kind. So, there's evidence that there's interspecial communication and not necessarily that monkey talking to that bird, but that bird just from being around these monkeys using language, mm -hmm. picking up certain words and speaking monkey ease, even though the bird actually speaks parodies or something. Yeah. I mean, it's not any different, I think, than, you know, I have cats and dogs and they each have their own respective feeding times and programs and systems and treat systems. And sometimes one will get a little of the other. Like, uh, for instance, my dog Charlie will lick the wet cat food spoon after I give them their wet cat food. Ooh, la, la. So now Charlie knows when I say, uh, do you want your good stuff, which is what I say to the cats, and they come running in there for the wet food, mm -hmm. Charlie knows, hey, that's when I get to lick that spoon. So uh, I'm speaking English, and each of these animals is understanding what I'm saying, even though for Charlie, I'm speaking cat, although that's really not true. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, I know what you mean. It's, but you know it, what I mean? It holds up and it, it applies. It's also, you can make the case very much like an English-speaking person in America who's got a bodega down the street, mm -hmm. understands what que pasa means or ay, 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 or something like that, right? Yeah. Like, it's like this living in proximity of people who speak other languages, you pick up other languages, and that seems to very much be analogous to what we're talking about with the birds living around the Campbell's monkeys. Yeah, I guess the true comparison would be if my cats made a, a distinctive meow when they wanted, and who knows, they might, when they right. want that good stuff and that, that signal, Charlie. Yeah, but I think your analogy still worked. Too. Okay, thanks, man. No problem. You want to tell them about Khan? Uh, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, there's a biologist named Khan uh, Slobodikov. Slobodikov. Oh, no, that's not right at all. No, it's not. Slobodchikov. Oh, nice work. I think you totally nailed it. Yeah. Oddly enough, Khan is the one that throws me. I've never heard that as a first name. C-A-C-O-N, not yeah. K-H-A-N, like Khan. Yeah, right. This is just Khan. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, that person is a biologist, and they study prairie dogs, and that they found that they have very distinct sounds that, uh, when they're talking about predators, that basically say what kind of predator is coming. Um, how, what color they are, how big they are, uh, how fast they're coming at us. And they can combine all those sounds in different ways. If it's an, let's say it's an animal they've never, a predator they've never seen, mm -hmm. they can combine those other words to kind of say, this is a new thing and not the whatever hunts a prairie dog. Right. Like if you saw a, a somehow a pterosaur came through a time warp into modern day Atlanta and we <laughs> yeah. were standing outside. Uh -huh. We didn't know a pterosaur because we'd never seen one before. We might say something like, look, a flying green dragon monster. Mm -hmm. And that gets generally the point across. What uh, Slob Slobodchikov found nice. is that prairie dogs do the same thing. Yeah. 
and that they also have a tonal language very similar to Mandarin where different changes in intonation of the mm-hmm. same phoneme mean totally different things and that they layer these different tones, that these prairie dogs' language may actually be more complex than other languages in, in that, use, that are used by humans. Yeah, tonally. <laughs> right? Oh, I thought you were making a joke like totally. No, 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 tone. <laughs> yeah, tonally. Tonally speaking, not like the number of words or whatever. Tonally tubular. Uh, and that they, um, he fed all this stuff through a computer to, to pick out like just very, I caught that by the way. I know, but you're giving me nothing today. <laughs> Are you mad because I keep fooling you these days? Yeah, maybe that's it. Okay. Um, to the max. Uh, so he fed this stuff into a computer so they could analyze, like, you know, stuff that humans can't even hear, like a program designed to analyze little minute differences. Mm -hmm. And what they found out was when they did experiments of, like, human beings walking and approaching the prairie dogs, they would say something different for here comes the tall guy in the hat rather than uh, here comes the short woman in the high heels. (laughs) Right, we're walking through the prairie. Yeah, you know, because uh, all those short ladies in high heels. Right, and the tall man in the yellow hat. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. So um, so things are starting to kind of pick up here. Uh, there's an, one more we need to throw out that really had a, a big um, uh, effect on demonstrating language mm-hmm. use among, um, among animals, and that was among Japanese tits yeah. using grammar. Um, these these are, are birds, by the way. Cute little birds, yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you for rescuing me from sure. angry parents. <laughs> um, and they have a distinct sound for snake. Yeah. And if you say that, if you take that sound, mm-hmm. I, I'm not quite sure what the sound is, but I believe it's more than one part, and you play it out of order, it means nothing to them, to the right. birds. But if you play it in order, they're like, oh, my God, a snake where? And they've they've um, that shows that there is grammar. There's word order counts. It, and if it were just innate, if it were just an involuntary reflex, it wouldn't matter how you said that. If they heard one of those tones or whatever, it would it would evoke some sort of reaction or response. So you can speak gibberish to Japanese tits just by switching the word order or the order of the yeah. sounds, which is the same thing basically as switching word order. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, This, you know, now we get to the question of, is this something that they've learned or is it instinctive? Like, are their older counterparts teaching them these languages Mm -hmm. or are they born with it? And we have a couple of really cool examples. Um, One is something we talked about uh, at length in the B episode, which was the waggle dance that honeybees do. Uh, Basically, um, to show another bee where the food is, uh, they use their body position in relation to the sun and do this little vibrating waggle mm-hmm. to indicate the distance. And that's how they tell everyone, like, hey, let's go find this honey. Uh, in 1973, a gentleman named Carl von Frisch won a Nobel Prize in physiology by translating this dance and kind of figuring it out. And then just this year, in 2023, they did a study about whether this was learned or something they're born with. Mm-hmm. And they found that it's it's super cool, but it's a little bit of both. So they got little baby bees who hadn't seen this waggle dance yet, isolated them, and they they found that they actually did try the waggle dance. So it is somewhat innate, something they're born with, but they weren't very good at it. And when they compared those to other baby bees who mm-hmm. were living with adult bees who were ostensibly teaching them this dance, right. they, they did it much, much better, were way more accurate as far as the distance goes. And so they found that, like, yeah, they are born with it to a certain degree, but they get better at it by being taught. Yes. And just a teeny, teensy bit of it is Maybelline. Right. <laughs> All right. There you go. You happy? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so um, there's – so bees uh, – that's uh, – wiggle dance is, is almost just entirely incomprehensible to us, except yeah. for Carl von Hirsch. He figured it out. Um, uh, much more closely relatable to us – are um, hand signals, the communication that a lot of the great apes use. Yeah. Um, And what they found is that across apes, there's similar gestures for similar meanings, but that groups and different species can use slightly different gestures, whether Mm -hmm. it's a hand gesture. I think chewing on a leaf a certain way is flirting. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of different um, communicative 
body language or body yeah. gestures that apes use, but that they can be slightly different based on groups, which is a dialect. A dialect is the use of a, a, a similar language or the same language in slightly different ways based on your group, your culture, your geography, what region you live in. It's exactly the same thing as the distinction between soda or pop or Coke, depending on where you live in the United States. Same thing, same meaning. Those are all English words. But you would say that based on where you live or where you were raised or the culture that you you were raised in. Yeah. And, you know, chimpanzees, of course, get a lot of uh, research on stuff like this. And I think people are more apt to believe that uh, a chimp would do something like that because they're just more like us. Mm -hmm. But they found the same thing in all kinds of animals, uh, one of which is the naked mole rat. Uh, that they respond, as far as the dialects go, they respond to soft chirps mm -hmm. from people in their own colonies more than they do those uh, a similar-sounding soft chirp in a different colony. So, in other words, it's a different dialect. Um, and we're going to be doing one on naked mole rats at some point. Easy there. Because I forgot, uh, forgot how much I love this animal from uh, watching the great documentary Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control mm. by uh, master documentarian Errol Morris. And we'll talk about it when we eventually get to that episode. Okay, so save great, it. Great doc. I highly recommend it, though. Um, you want to hear something super amazing? Yes. Do you remember in, I think, our Evolution of in Human Intelligence episode, we talked about how they think the word he might actually be so old that Neanderthals might have used it? Like, it's one of the yeah. oldest sounds that humans make? Mm -hmm. There, The hand gesture for come here that you use where you kind of point right in front of you with your fingers downward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, apes, yeah. Apes use that. Oh, wow. We still use the same hand gesture that we used back when we were full-on great apes. That's awesome. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like we just, it just works so well. Why, why fix what ain't broke, we decided, over millions and millions of years. That's super cool. I think, so. I think we should take a break. And because we have a star of the show that's about to appear, uh, several, but uh, a big star of the show is about to appear in communication, and that's called The Whale. And we'll be back to talk about whales right after this. Okay, Chuck, so in addition to the Naked Mole Rat episode, I want to do an episode on the Save the Whales movement that was highly oh, successful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to do that. Okay. Um, but central to that was a guy named Roger Payne, who mm -hmm. I'm sure will come quite a bit in that episode. So we won't get into him too deeply, but he was, a, I believe, a bi biological acoustician, some mm -hmm. really arcane specialty. Yeah, he made and it up. He <laughs> basically— <laughs> He, um, I guess, had friends in U.S. Navy listening stations um, that had been set up to eavesdrop on Navy, uh, Soviet submarines. And those Navy stations were turning up these amazing recordings of whale songs that people mm -hmm. just didn't realize existed up to that point. And Roger Payne, like, wrote a science article on it that came out um, in the early 70s. And then simultaneous to that, he introduced it to the larger public, not just the scientific community, with an album called Songs of the Humpback Whale. Mm -hmm. It was released in 1970. It is recordings, I think a 35-minute album of recording of, of whale songs. It went multi-platinum because I imagine that you could take acid or smoke pot and just sit there and zone <laughs> out to that for hours. But also it really dovetailed with the nascent um, uh, environmental movement that was coming along at the same time too. And that actually helped contribute to the Save the Whales campaign that was highly successful just from releasing that album. Yeah, I've listened to it today. Um, you can stream it anytime you want. It's uh, I'm sure you listened to it, right? I did, and I found it distracting. I, like even though it's instrumental, and uh -huh. silent, I was my mind kept being like, "What the hell is that?" And I, I couldn't concentrate, so I had to turn it off. Oh, interesting. Because I found it to be because I can only listen to very specific kinds of music when mm -hmm. I do this study stuff. Uh, like, mainly it's Brian Eno and now Songs of the Humpback Whales. <laughs> and Brian Adams. <laughs> and Brian Adams. Uh, it was good, though. I like it. I mean, it's not 
um, it is very much background music and it's not even like a, like I would defy anyone to even say like, oh, if you listen, it's like a melodic and it's like a song. It's really not. It's whales making noises, but mm -hmm. I just found it very relaxing. Yeah, it is. I it's it. very cool. I can imagine like if I were, if I were just kind of sitting around zoning out on that, it would be mm -hmm. extraordinarily pleasant, but my brain just wants to focus yeah, on, on acid. <laughs> on PCP. Uh, there are all kinds of whales, though, and they have all kinds of communications um, that we've learned about over the years. Uh, the sperm whale, they have what they call like a coda click pattern. Um, and it depends. It's, it's kind of like a dialect as well, I guess, because it depends on what clan. Uh, and clans are, you know, groups of huge, huge groups of whales. Sometimes there are thousands of them hmm. uh, made up of smaller groups, usually uh, five to ten female adults and their kids. But they get together in these big clans, and the different clans have, you know, variations of their language. And when they have overlapping territories, they they get really, really distinct because they're overlapping so they can tell one another apart. Yeah. They have like a clan signifier that they use to identify themselves to others, right? Because yeah. these whales don't really navigate the world by eyesight. They mostly do it from sound. Mm -hmm. So that's how you would do that. Um, and these clicks apparently can last about 10 milliseconds, but they're 236 decibels in volume. And to give you a, 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 a comparison, mm -hmm. I think that's the word I'm groping for. Totally. A gunshot is okay. 140 decibels. Okay. Okay? Your pain threshold starts around there. So if you happen to be sitting next to a um, a sperm whale mm -hmm. underwater, when it you, let out one of these clicks, it would blow your eardrums right out and possibly your entire head. I can only picture you now underwater sitting in your don't be dumb chair. <laughs> <laughs> Just floating above it. Or standing awkwardly beside it. Yeah. Or underneath it. Or who knows? Th <laughs> things, things got weird. <laughs> yeah, it, it did get a little weird right out of the gate, really. Uh, well, that was the whole point. And I love for your... Um, uh, Instagram birthday post when I asked people to make their favorite Josh moments. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of don't be dumb in there. I don't know if you noticed. I did. And thank you for that. That was extraordinarily kind of you. Of course, man. That's all true. But uh, people love don't be dumb. I get it. <laughs> You're like, I get it, everybody. Just shut up. No, it was great. <laughs> uh, baby sperm whales and orcas uh, have like baby talk. They babble just like a little human baby would, mm -hmm. when they're learning, um, newborn orcas make a really high-pitched call. Uh, it changes as they grow into adults, into a completely different sound. And it starts at about two months, uh, the adult-sounding stuff. They start to learn, basically, Right. it seems like, at about two months. And then for years and years until they hit puberty, they are learning new vocalizations, uh, a.k.a. words. Exactly like the development of human kids, too. Yeah. Um, orcas also, uh, very much like those birds that live around the Campbell's monkeys, they can learn the calls of other species, too, that they live around. Yeah. Apparently, orcas can um, understand what bottlenose dolphins are saying to one another. Again, bottlenose dolphin is not trying to communicate with the orca. The orca right. is just eavesdropping. And if it hears, like, oh, there's some really great salmon over here, steer mm -hmm. clear, the orca will be like, I'm going straight to it because I love Chinook salmon. Yeah. The, the dolphin actually has my fact of the podcast uh, that I can't wait to tell Ruby later on. What? Uh, they name themselves. Mm -hmm. Within the first few months of being born, they create a very signature whistle to identify themselves. So they, you know, that's their name. Yeah. And so this, I really want to make sure that this lands because sperm whales have clan codas. Mm -hmm. You're saying to other sperm whales, I'm a member of um, of the the Jamboree clan or whatever, right. <laughs> whatever the, they would name themselves. I'm sure it's yeah. like in click sounds. Uh, yeah. But that's for their clan membership, not them as individuals. Bottlenose dolphins name themselves as individuals. Like, this is my name. I'm Josh the dolphin. Good to meet you. That is what they're doing. Like, that's it's that level of identity, individual identity that they're using to introduce themselves to other dolphins. Amazing. It is. That, that really is one of the facts of the podcast, and the podcast chock full of facts of the podcast. Uh, so we should probably talk about the brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, like, you know, the question, like, have we ever actually studied the brain of these animals to see if they're anything like humans? Because we know so much about human brains and 
the the areas of the brain that handle communication and, and like emotion and stuff like that that comes out through communication. And yes, they have. Uh, and we're going to talk about something called spindle cells, uh, which were discovered in 1881 and then basically went away and were rediscovered in 1995. And these are specialized neurons that are in two very specific brain regions, uh, the ACC, the anterior uh, cingulate cortex, and the frontal insula, the FI. And they've basically established that both of these, these regions of the brain in humans are where we experience our emotion and are really important for like monitoring ourselves and our bodies and how we feel like, are we in pain? Are we hungry? Um, did we goof something up? Like right. so, self-monitoring, basically. Yeah, not just self-monitoring like on the individual level, but in relation to other people. Like you said, like, did we goof something up? Should we feel embarrassed? Have we made a social gaffe? All of these things are kind of controlled, self-monitoring, self-reflection by the the anterior cingulate cortex and the frontal insula, right? So our our ability to f- empathize, essentially, is what we're talking about, mm-hmm. is from the activity of these two. And they're characterized by a large number of spindle cells, and only spindle cells are found in these areas, okay? Right. So we're like, okay, spindle cells, that's the seed of empathy, of emotion, of understanding other people. Well, it turns out that, um, I, I, I don't know if it's neuron for neuron, um, sperm whales have more spindle cells than human beings do. Yeah. Okay. So we have really good evidence. And it's not just sperm whales. There are other cetaceans. Um, a lot of the great apes have spindle cells too. Don't ask how we know this, by the way. But we're, we found that they have <laughs> the makings of what it would take to empathize with others. And if you put that together... With the assumption or the growing um, understanding that they're communicating in very deep levels, it would make sense that if we can decode what they're saying, we'll find they have quite a bit to say that we could conceivably, you know, understand and connect with. Yeah. that's. I mean, that's just incredible. It really is because what we're seeing with those spindle cells is they're not like, um, you know, I'm hungry. Let's eat that snake. And that's like the extent, the most fascinating thing a, a, a chimp says on any given day. Who knows what they're thinking? Like it just opens up a whole universe of possibility about what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Because bear in mind, they're also experiencing life and the universe and the world and everything um, in, in a totally different way than we are. So the idea of being able to tap into that and then to share our experience with them, I mean, I can't imagine what just massive impacts that would have on humanity and hopefully on the world and in general, if we could do that. Oh yeah. Well, and to, to be able to figure a lot of this stuff out, they've, they've, we've long realized that some of this stuff is just beyond our abilities. Uh, the, the crow is one example they use. Like crows have a lot of different vocalizations of varying pitches and durations and inflections and rhythms and cadences Mm-hmm. And there's just no way that humans could listen enough, basically, and isolate these crows by sex and age and social status and where they are and to be able to really learn all of this stuff. So, you know, we talked about AI and large language models recently and um, got a few emails from people that are like, you know, there seemed to be a lot of fear based stuff in this, which is true. Um, and you guys didn't focus on any of the like great possibilities and maybe we didn't. So here's one cool thing that AI is going to potentially do and that they're already starting to use mm-hmm. is helping out just sort of like we have figured out or how AI is working with large language models as predictors of like w- how a human might type a sentence that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And doing the same thing with animals, basically, and trying to figure out their language. Yeah, just detecting patterns, figuring out what words are important, how they're being used, all this stuff. They've already got it. Um, I think Deep Squeak was the first one that analyzes rodent sounds. And yeah. there's a couple of groups. One is SETI, C-E-T-I, Cetacean Translation Initiative Project. Mm-hmm. Um, that's led by a, a guy named David Gruber. They have, the, the way I saw it put is that they're going all in on one clan, the EC2 clan of sperm whales off the yeah. island of Dominica. And they have they are completely observing and monitoring this clan of sperm whales 24 hours a day, 
every day of the year. They're down to using robotic fish that are gathering yeah. video and audio <laughs> and everything that swim along Amazing. with the whales. Um, they know everything that these whales are doing at any given moment. And so not only are they getting these whale songs and collecting them to feed into this um, the, the large language model to understand it, they're also notating this stuff so that the context is also understood too. Because what they, what they think is that a different click or coda, depending on the context, can totally change meaning. So they also need to know this too, but it's a huge undertaking. They have like tens of thousands of whale song right now to probably crack this language they're going to need millions so it's they they've they've started on the road but they've got a ways to go yeah and it's like I, I think what they're looking for is that next level which is not um oh wow the whales told other whales where the good fish were mm -hmm. or whatever is they want answers to things like uh, do whales tell stories like very rudimentary stories to one another. Or very advanced stories. Why does it have to be rudimentary, sure. you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, do they, um, if something like something big happens to a whale clan, do they talk about it afterward? Like a right. week later, does someone bring this up? Do they, do these math in any way? And these are all like questions that would just blast open the door. Uh, like if answered, just blast open the door of our understanding of how animals may talk to one another. Yeah. So SETI is eavesdropping in order to understand what whales are saying. There's another project called the Earth Species Project, ESP, that is in part looking at types of whales, not only to learn what they're saying, but to speak to them directly. So the difference between the two projects is almost like the difference between SETI and METI, as mm -hmm. far as searching for alien intelligence is concerned. It's very similar in nature. Um, but one of the things the Earth Species Project is trying to do is map all species languages to find universal terms or universal right. concepts and understand the different words. So you could translate tiger into whale, into human, into, you know, um, uh, Japanese tit. Right. Or, or if they're like conceptually, like you were talking about, are there overlaps in things like uh, grief or joy or these other like big sort of umbrella experiences that seemingly any living thing could experience? Right, exactly. And like you said, it would blow things awesome. open. It totally. Some people are like, this would change humans forever. Like, how could anybody eat meat after that point? If you can understand a pig is saying, please don't kill me, please don't kill me while you're killing it. Right. You, you couldn't do it. And if you did, people would stop you kind of thing. Other people are like, well, I'm worried that we're going to use it to manipulate animals. And people will probably try to do that too. The, up, the outcome would likely be both. Like humans would be changed, our our, our um, relationship with the animal world would be forever changed for the better and the worse. And that's just kind of how life goes. But that kind of change, I, I can't imagine how amazing it would be to witness that. Yeah. I also thought this thing, the one thing you sent was really cool about like, because um, the idea of like, all right, let's say we could finally get there, like, or understand, you know, I think, um, who was the guy that was named Garber? He's the yeah. head of SETI. Gruber. He, yeah, Gruber, yeah. Yeah, Hans Gruber was, he was like, you know, everyone's really excited. He said, that also could be a real letdown. It could be like they the, the do talk. It's just super boring. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea that, you know, this thing that you sent about like, well, what if we could communicate? What would, what would we have to talk about with a whale? Mm -hmm. And that's where you start to look at like larger commonalities of living things. Uh, and in the case of a whale, you're like, you know, I got kids. You got kids. I love to swim. I love to sleep. Uh, we're both mammals. Like we got, we have a handful of things we could actually talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the idea of like objectivity as a scientist comes in because it's, and not objectivity in that like I really want this to happen or not, but mm -hmm. objectivity of just like uh, a, a, an experience that a whale can understand, can't even understand like being dry. Mm -hmm. Like, we would talk about being wet in a different context than a whale would because a whale would just say, like, what do you mean wet? Like, right. all is wet. Exactly. And we would say, no, like, wet's when you take a shower or get in a swimming pool. But the hope is, is that if they are capable of empathy, they're probably capable of metaphor and that we could explain things to one another like prairie dogs do, like yellow, tall human in, in hat. Right. Getting th getting ideas and concepts across just enough for the other one to kind of understand things that are totally foreign to them. Or whaling ship nearby. Swim yeah. it the other way. Exactly. <laughs>
um, there was a, I saw somebody theorize that you could teach a, like a large language model to analyze and learn to speak, teach itself to speak whale. But because we don't understand how large language models actually work, the the AI and the whale could have a conversation and we would have no idea what they were saying. That's frightening. It is. It's frightening, but it's also like wah, wah, hilarious yeah, too. Totally. Like imagine putting all that work into it and that's the outcome. Yeah. You'd have to build another AI to tell you what the first AI is talking about. Let's do it. Cool. Pretty neat stuff. I agree. And I feel like we're not done with this topic. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. I think there's more to more to come. All right. Oh, by the way, there is a listener who is, did you see that email that has grouped our stuff into uh, tranches, suites? No, I didn't see that one. Uh, I'll make sure I'll forward it to you. I haven't even answered him back yet, but his name is Robert Fiddler, uh, ironically enough, because he's fiddling about with uh, with our content. And he has created suites and subsuites in a in a in a uh, spreadsheet for us. That's awesome. Thanks, Robert. And it's, jeez, looking over it. Justice system, police, true crime. Those are the big ones. Economics, <laughs> finance, atmospheric science. Weird. Natural disasters, natural resources. Boy, this is amazing. Yeah. I haven't even really looked through it yet. But anyway, shout out to, uh, he called himself Robbie. Robbie Fiddler. Yeah. Maybe we could publish it at some point or something on our website. Oh, we'll have to but copyright Robbie Fiddler. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, anyway, did you say listener mail? No. Okay. Why don't you set me up then in well, the traditional way? Chuck's feeling like a chatty Kathy, so that means it's time for listener mail. There you go. Uh, hey, guys. I'm an 11-year-old Canadian living in Australia, and we've been listening to your show my whole life. Uh, my dad's tell me he would listen to stuff you should know when cuddling me in the middle of the night oh. when I was just a BB. Uh, we love your podcast and hope you make many more for many years to come. We hope to see a live show soon. I uh, love it when you guys do mysteries because they're one of my favorite things to listen to on your channel. You've expanded my imagination and creativity and intelligence. Uh, me and my dad get into big conversations about your episodes because they're so intriguing and we discuss what we've learned and what we think. I'm just emailing you to let you know that my dad and I are traveling across a big chunk of Australia on a road trip in July to see the Australian Zoo. Uh, my dad has so many stuff you should know to listen to on the way and I'm really excited to listen to the podcast and go to the zoo. Uh, oh, and your jokes are pretty funny, but I make them even funnier, and we all have a good laugh. <laughs> nice. He's playing off our jokes. It's collaborative. I love it. So uh, that says, love, dictated, but not read, <laughs> from uh, Reese. Reese, you're pretty cool, I just have to say. Yeah, and a little request from Reese. Uh, I imagine this is aimed at you. Please do one more of the voice from the last Halloween special. It's my dad's favorite. Yeah. I got to think that Reese is talking about my friend Smeagol. Yeah, I have to go back and listen to Smeagol again because he apparently um, was off last time I tried it. So I'm not Oh, was he? Again. Yeah. From what I hear. All right. Some people gonna... emailed in and were like, that was not right. All right. You can let down an 11 year old. I'm, I'm fine if you're fine. Uh, yeah, I'm prepared to do that. <laughs> All right, well, just listen in, Reese, and Josh will uh, brush up on his smeagol. And... Eventually, Reese, and when I do it next, you can be like, that was for me. Exactly. Okay. Well, if you want to be like Reese and show how super cool you are naturally without any effort whatsoever, we would love to hear from you. You can send it in an email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.